seems like a comfy spot to hang out. Ah, not bad. Wow. Oh, hi there. Name's Jacques Castleflower. Nice to meet you. Um, were you confused about there being too many options in each camera company? Should I go for a high-end cinema camera? Will you get the same results with a little beater, beater cam? Let's talk about it. All I want is the perfect camera. All I want is the perfect camera. I'm at a castle uh, in the rule of sixths. Uh, not bad. Not bad. There's a Canadian flag I'm covering up. The cinema could be ours today, my friend. So today's going to be an interesting episode. I got a bunch of notes here talking about is it really worth getting the high end of each camera company will compare some stuff versus like the budget option sometimes that's better for you and we're gonna test i brought three crammers with me i said that weird we're on the black magic og right now with the leica 25 mil 1.4 a lot of busy areas here a lot of cars i did not plan this out Google Maps, you lied to me. <laughs> so today's episode is gonna be about how to pick the sweet spot camera for each camera company. Because like you could say, oh, Sony FX9 is Sony's best camera. You could say the Venice, but then you're like, how much does that cost? How much does it weigh? Is it worth like the rigging up versus the cost versus the function? Let's talk, let's talk a little life. So we'll start with Sony. I'm doing each camera company, by the way. It might be a long video. FX9, $12,000, $250. That's way too much. Full frame, but like they don't even have 4K 120p. From what I heard, maybe there's a firmware update. It's not coming to the A7S 3 that's for sure. FX6, okay, you're 6,000. You're in a somewhat reasonable plane of existence, but from what I've heard from filmmakers who love their black magic cams, they always say, wow, Sony, I got this because the autofocus is so good. And but there's this digital look to the image. It does not look good. That's Sony's problem. So what are you gonna do? Everything below that is also gonna look digital. So deal with it. You get a black Pro Mist filter. I'm side litten. The sun has blessed us. I did not account for exposure changes. Oh boy, let's hurry. FX3, you're getting into like, I'm a mini cinema cam now, $3,900. But the A7S III is cheaper and you get a viewfinder in case you need that. I sometimes do, for wildlife especially, but even if it's sunny out, just setting up your shot, it's so nice to look through a viewfinder sometimes. So it's like, could you really recommend the FX3? What's the point? It's actually slightly heavier too. It does get more firmware love, but nothing that you would like absolutely need. Come on now. So A7S III, ZV-E1. 2200 so you're saving $1,300 for the same sensor, same specs, almost everything but the viewfinder. That's it. It's so much lighter. I think it has improved Sony color science. Might it be? And then you're dropping hard off a cliff to the Sony FX30, which is now an APS-C sensor. Everything else was full frame. 1600 kind of nice but that's 646 grams that's almost the weight of my a7s3 what is the point the zve1 if you could save a couple dollars to get up to full frame and you're lighter than this APS-C it's like same specs but full frame and lighter they both don't have viewfinders wow and then the a6700 is as low as we're gonna stoop today in the Sony universe $1,400 493 grams so it's like you save 200 bucks over the fx30 same specs you get a viewfinder it's crap but hot damn it's lighter and that's kind of nice so i think we all know the answer to this question the sweet spot in the sony lineup is the sony zve1 you have to deal with not having a viewfinder and then all of a sudden you cannot do wildlife if wildlife was super important to you then you're looking either the A7S III or the Sony A6700. And you could get a much cheaper lens than the 200 to 600 on full frame. You get the 70 to 350. So like you're debating those two, but for like vlogging, same basic thing. A67 much 
lighter. 100. I mixed it. Now, while Sony is amazing, best autofocus in the business, dynamic range, very pleasing. If you know how to color grade, you might have a respectable shot. They're known for having bad colors, terrible stabilization, and strange ISO performances. The best at high ISO, but getting up there, like even 3200 on A7S III can be like, wow, that's bad already. Micro Four Thirds outperforms you, that's embarrassing. But there are workarounds for Sony reptilian losers with green skin. If you can color your face better, work on those skills. And then if you don't mind using Catalyst Brows sometimes, you have like the best day, but just takes a lot of extra time. And like learn how to light your scene better. Sony's a decent shot. Let's switch. I'm in the rule of half once and facing the wrong way. Oh, that's good times. Now we're on the Canon EOS R in 4K with the Zeiss Planar 50mm 1.4. Stop down to 25. Ah, uh, 4K. Worse than APS-C, but sharp if I'm in focus, which is very unlikely. When it comes to the Canon universe, I swear, man, you're starting with the Canon C500 Mark II cinema cam, top of the line. For Ow! This is the worst sweater. It pinches my beard. Don't look to the left, you piece of shit. $11,000. Unbelievable. I saw an ad today for this camera, and it said, make me an offer. I'm like, how much is it? He's probably going to reply with, I don't know, man, make an offer. It's like, 400 C300 Mark III, 9,000. Like, Canon wants you in this cinema line, but it's so ridiculous and not even beneficial to your life. You might have a slightly nicer image. It's gonna be softer than what you're used to on your Canon R5 or R7, but like it'll look nice to professionals or worse. And so expensive and cumbersome. C200, 3500, not bad. You get raw 4K, but those files are huge. But good luck. You have to build a whole world around just holding the files, your entire, and you need a whole wall of SSD drives. Can you afford that? The strange thing is, if you go to the C70, $5,300, more expensive than the C200, and you lose quite a bit. You lose some stuff. You don't have... See, here's the thing. You're looking at like a Canon R6 II. You have animal eye detect and video. Everything's great. Dual pixel autofocus. You're laughing. You go to the C70 or the R... Ow! The R5C and you lose these functions. Even though they're video cameras, you lose video functionality. That's so just embarrassing by Canon, the hammer. I'm at a castle. You're not even allowed in the parking lot. I'm praising you. By the end of this list, someone's gonna buy something. I'm thinking of it. Relax. The Canon R8 has what sized battery? I tried the R5C a long time ago and it was a glorious image. You could shoot raw, 6K raw. It was like, wow, this is amazing. And then you could do like super crops, a 1080 raw, 120 frames per second for like macro. It was like really magical, but you do not have auto exposure in that, nor animal eye detect. So when we come down to a more reasonable level, the Canon R5, still 3400. This is all American dollars on B&H. 8K raw, like you would need that. But I don't know, man. I don't think the R5 is the sweet spot. R6 II, hmm, interesting. You have like almost everything you would want as a videographer, even more than you would ever need, false color and stuff. But like you have 4K 60 with no crop, HD 180, both have autofocus. There's nothing weird happening. You can shoot in log. There's nothing removed from you, like the iPhone. Oh, I'm log. Oh, you want to do slow-mo? Oh, sorry about that. Do you mind if we over sharpen your face and turn it to plastic? Ow. I do mind. Canon R8, same sensor as the R6 II. You get almost everything except a battery. For some reason, Canon just felt the hammer on that one and they knocked several pieces, several chips out of that battery and it doesn't last very long, but that's the only deal breaker to me. 
I don't even care that it doesn't have IBIS because from what I've seen, Canon Digital Stabe is better than Sony IBIS and Fuji IBIS. So it's like, pick your poison on that one. Like it works. And most of Canon's RF lenses have Stabe in it. So you get lens Stabe plus digital. It's gonna beat anything Sony, Fuji, frickin' I doubt Nikon. Nikon will win. But R8 for $1,400 and being the lightest full frame we even know of, wow. And the last one on this list, R7. Same money as the R8, but APS-C and it's heavier. You get the battery back, but you lose half the sensor size. And so what about your two card slots? Give me one of your cards, I'll mail it to Japan. It's not even a joke, it made no sense. So with the R6 II being $2,500 and the R8 being almost the same thing for $1,400, I think R8 is your sweet spot camera of Canon universe. I'm like, I'll be honest with you. I got this lens, 50 mil 1.4. I shoot it in 1080p, it's okay. It's okay, but when you punch on in to 4K, you get the magic. My God, but it's such a crop. I just have to think that the R8 in full frame 4K would totally outdo this thing. In fact, let's just switch to 1080p for a second. Okay, first, how about we turn off enhanced stabilization for some reason. Oh God, I hate my life so much. So that's what we were watching when we switched to the Canon. It was 4K with enhanced stabe, less than a one inch sensor. I was doing that for the hyperlapse through the woods, which didn't even work. And then I forgot to turn it back. Oh, I hate my life. So now we're in 4K. Ow. Ah. Let's switch to 1080 now to see it. And then we'll talk about the next company. Okay, now we're in 1080. I didn't move the camera just to keep it with the same crop. So we'll talk about the next camera company in this mode and then I'll bring it closer for a more respectable image and then we switch on to the Sone with something else. So I think Canon R8 is your sweet spot for the money. Not bad, Canon. Wish you had that battery in there. Just a side rant on the battery. This Canon EOS R battery, even though it's getting low now, I use it for like a week straight, like 20 videos. Like it's so nice to have that. You have no idea. It sucks when you're like always thinking, oh, am I gonna make it through even this video? Give me some less stress. Now, when it comes to Nikon, you have almost nothing. In fact, I only wrote down your ZF because it's the only full frame camera you have with a flippy screen. Ow, $2,000. Not bad, 4K60 with a crop, and you have photo dials. It's a photo-centric camera. It really hurts that that's like our only option for Nikon at this point. It would be glorious. I just watched my old Nikon Z50 versus Fuji X-T4 review, and I just, I preferred the Nikon in every way. It made me wish that I had pounced on the Nikon Z30 when I saw it for like 500 because now it's like 800 plus tax or something stupid. I saw a used one, it was so cheap. I was like, I should just buy it just to have it. In the future, I might get something for it. So I want to be in Nikon. You, do you, are you hearing me, Nike? Make something for me. I wanna love you. I wanna be like, oh, Nikon's the underdog, but look what we can do. Look at our color science. Our auto exposure technology was so swift and smooth. Autofocus up there with Sony, almost a little below. Fantastic. So I don't know, the sweet spot, it's not even that. I say you just bite the bullet, you go ZB, what? Nike, ow, Nike on Z30, and just be done with it. You get your 12 to 28, your vlogging, and then maybe a prime of some sort, and you'll live but it's super cheap and super light. It's just very dated, 8-bit. No log, no nothing. It sucks, you suck. Okay, we've moved the camera a little closer now. Still in HD, full HD. These trucks will be the death of me. 
I got a comment, someone was like, you should be labeling it full HD, is that's the truth. No one cares. 720p is dead. You can't even film 720p in most cameras. And the fact that HD came out and then full HD debunked the lie that was half of an HD. That's just an ethical mishap that I don't want to be a part of. So Nikon, you suck, but I wish I could love you. Panasonic. You got basically two options. Your full frame with your S5 II, 4K60 with a crop, 2,000 bucks, okay. Or the G9 II, 1,900, $100 less for four times the smaller sensor, but you get 4K 120 and HD 300, but no autofocus. And in both cameras, you have oversaturated reds for some reason. You put a lot on and you're just like, what happened there? Oh, there's a beautiful red tree. I should have filmed near that. Oh, that hurts. That, that hurts. Are you sick of the castle? I'm not moving. In my opinion, if I was offered both of those right now, Panasonic Pony of Hope shows up and he's like, sir, you can pick one of these. I think I will have the, ow, you bit me. You son of a bitch, get out of here. I would 100% go for the G9 II. It's not even a funny like decision here. It's not even a debate. Thank you for ruining that exposure or enhancing it. No, we're clipping. G9 II with the superior specs, beautiful slow motion and like a glass. I mean, I know S5 has the more exp more expensive real Leica glass. These are just like fake Panasonics with a Leica name on it. I don't mind that at all. It's fantastic actually. So like 100% G92 is your sweet spot. We're waiting for the GH7, might be nice, but like anything else in Micro Four Thirds is just stupid to think about. A GH6, good luck selling that one. Okay, let us switch it up a notch to Sony with a little Zeiss fun, uh-huh. Sony, auto, focus. Why, thank you. We're on the Zeiss 35mm 2.8, stopping down to Tony 4. Hopefully the castle is in your heart. We only have a couple more options, really. I think I've mentioned the big companies that are worth buying into. When it comes to Fuji, you have the worst stave in the business. It hurts the soul to even say that because you have a smaller sensor than full frame. Nikon full frame is better, IBIS. Panasonic way better. Sony better with active stabe. It's sad, I don't understand it. X-H2S is $2,500 and you have noisy 240 frames per second. Autofocus somewhat jerky and unreliable. And the auto exposure <laughs> not so reliable and somewhat stepping especially if you use the Tonys to step it and your Ivis we've mentioned the sweet spot in my opinion is the XS20 which is basically the same camera as the XH2S you lose a couple codecs but you don't have that same noise pattern in the 240 frames per second I think you even have improved autofocus algorithms just not much dials, that's the only point. And all the other stuff, like autofocus being jerky, same shit, auto exposure, eh. IBIS, wow, terrible. But XS20 is your sweet spot, $1,300, that's not much. APS-C, beautiful image, you can make it work in your life. How come everyone speeds up at right here? When it comes to OM system, I know I'm harsh on them, I don't know why I'm, like I come off way harsher than I need to be. Like I had a dream like a couple weeks ago, Gerald Undone was like, you know what, you're a bit harsh on them. I'm like, yeah, I don't know why. Like I remember saying like Olympus, like utter trash image. And then I'm looking at what I used to get with it. And it's like, it's a beautiful image. What are you talking about? Like the 4K 60 on that OM1 is beautiful for wildlife. Like I'm totally happy with this 10 bit decent it's just the when you go into the hd 120 and 240 they force you into this over sharpened image which it looks okay 
but like it's that's what we want to get away from as filmmakers or people who sit in front of castles pretending they live there. We want to get away with this over sharpened image because it's nasty, it's smartphone-ish. So like that's why people are loving the iPhone 15 because they get log now and they can shoot without plastic faces and over sharpened tones and but you can't do it in slow-mo. So it's like don't limit me. So the OM1 2000 bucks. I've noticed that Olympus has always been kind of pricey. All their lenses are like pretty high end there. I don't know, man, like they charge you money for it, but like you get the best IBIS in the business. The color science is only surpassed by Canon. It's right up there with like, wow, that is a natural look. That's what colors should mean to me. Colors, boom, 24P has no autofocus, that hurts. And your prices are insane. But like OM1, you could do worse. I would run this whole thing, it's just, the autofocus was less reliable than the EM-1 III. Ow. Sony. It looked like it was hunting there. You're bullshit, Sony, and you know it. When it comes to black magic, I have noticed one thing. I used to say 1080p is magic, it's all you need, it's better for the face. It's not. You lose the 3D pop, 4K is now the end game. That's our goal. It has to be a nice 4K camera. You can't come out with some 1080 thing. I don't mind the black am magic image, <laughs> the 1080p only on the OG. It's like, it's decent. It's pleasing, but whenever I switch to 4K, I'm blown away. So 4K is important. I think your sweet spot is still your old black magic 4K, which I'm really annoyed that they didn't upgrade that thing ever. It'd be nice because the 6K is way overkill. Nobody needs 6K, and if you want 4K in that and raw, you gotta crop in now. It's like, what's the point? So like your new full frame camera, it's 6K. I just want 4K, really nice 4K, and then all of a sudden I'm not full frame anymore. That hurts. And you only have HD 120 still. So it's like hard to recommend anything. $2,600 for their full frame, half the price for the 4K. I don't see it as like a good thing. They're not a versatile camera. It's, there's so much you have to put into it. Like you cannot autofocus, you can't auto expose. And I know filmmakers are like, oh, this is, you're on a film set and you take control of all this stuff. I get it, that's nice. But we're talking about YouTubers here who still want that nice image, but can really benefit from all these automated tools. Like right now we're in auto focus, but I've locked the exposure. We're, we're clipping hard in a lot of ways, but that's fine, it's fine. No IBIS and no NDs in that 6K black magic. So it's like, you got a lot, you're gimbaling, a cage, extra monitor. It's a whole system that I really wish Blackmagic would come out with a YouTuber's version that's still really nice and cinema look, but like easier to use and you don't have to rig it up crazy. They have the best screen in the business, but it doesn't flip around. I'll flip your mom around. I've done it. By the way, there's the red tree that I chose not to show you, but I brought it eventually. So the sweet spot, if you were to try to find the sweet spot of all those, wow, wow. I'm thinking it's the ZV-E1 out of everything there. You're debating between the ZV-E1 for 2200 or the Canon R8 at 1400. Then you're, you're laughing at someone. That's it, like the ZV-E1 kills it in most ways, but not bad. What do you think? What's the sweet spot for YouTubers? Video, not photography. Yeah, I'll leave. How you doing? You subscribing? Oh, there's a cart. Almost died on my own show. Again, it's bullshit. The Sony still, am I in the shot? I left the shot. Size 3D pop. That's what you're seeing now, even though it's 5.6. I'll go home.